One late winter day several years ago, I set out to locate an anomaly, an odd terrain feature near the crest of Johns Mountain in northern Floyd County. I'd first noticed the anomaly while looking at a topographic map showing elevation contours. To me, it looked like a cat's paw, so that's what I always called it, the cat's paw. Since I'd never seen anything like the cat's paw before, I decided to bushwhack up the mountainside and see what's there, what it looks like. Johns Mountain is in the Chattahoochee National Forest in northwest Georgia. This area is shown on the Sugar Valley Quadrangle, a map available from the U.S. Geological Survey. I was unsure whether the cat's paw would prove to be extraordinary or even discernible from the ground, but the markings on the map were intriguing and it was a good excuse to go for a long walk on one of my favorite mountains. Finding the cove would require elementary map reading skills and a willingness to bushwhack. There are no trails or roads in the vicinity and the terrain is steep, rocky, and heavily forested. The map indicated that a small stream originated in the cove, so all I had to do was find where it crossed the nearest road and then follow it upstream to its source. Much of Johns Mountain is U.S. Forest Service property, so I didn't have to ask permission to hike. I just parked my pickup truck at a roadside campsite a few miles south of a Forest Service recreation area called The Pocket. Then I tucked the map inside my jacket pocket, let my dog out of his carrier, and began walking. For the first half mile, the route ascended gradually through a hardwood forest. The rocky stream snaked between two steep parallel ridges that sloped down from the main spine of Johns Mountain. These ridges pinched together, confining the stream bed and my footsteps to a narrow, meandering course that required rock hopping across the shallow water a half dozen times. The stream was small and the walking was good, at least at first it was. With sparse underbrush and winter bare trees, I could see far into the gorge-like environment ahead. After a half mile, I came upon a cove so lovely that it seemed like a sanctuary. Poplar, cherry, beech, hickory, oak, and sycamore stood tall there. On the nearly cloudless day of my visit, mid-afternoon sunlight illuminated the sanctuary, reverently hushed, except for water splashing across rock like tinkling chimes. This sanctuary is solidly crafted of oak and pine and inlaid stone and is illuminated by radiant natural light. The beauty and serenity here reminded me of the hush in a cathedral. This was a fine place to refresh the spirit. Where the gently rising terrain ended, the side ridges parted to create an expansive circular alcove, an inner sanctum infused with winter sunlight. No stained glass window admitted the light, but a perfect dome of bright blue sky kissed the treetops, tracing wisps of white cirrus at each point of contact. Before proceeding further, I needed to re-examine the map. The Sugar Valley Quadrangle wasn't strictly clear on one point. It indicated that three small feeder streams plunged down the surrounding ridge sides, merging where I stood to form the slightly larger stream I had been following. The map showed that the West Prong, the one I planned to follow up Johns Mountain, was the biggest stream. To the contrary, I could readily see that the biggest stream coursed in from the south. Despite this discrepancy, there was no mistaking which stream to follow. I would walk up the West Prong, though it wasn't going to be easy. To this point, I had ascended over 200 feet in half a mile, a modest gradient that wouldn't tax any regular hiker. What followed, the scramble up the mountainside, would require considerably more effort. At 1,500 feet per mile, the gradient would far exceed the 700 feet per mile threshold that distinguishes our most arduous hiking trails. But that's part of bushwhacking. You can go where trails don't. The toughest part of the climb lasted only a third of a mile, managing over that distance to gain 500 feet in elevation. Dense thickets of sparkleberry and Virginia pine shaded rocks that speckled the mountainside like a field of cantaloupes promising a bountiful harvest. Here and there, there were signs of spring, like service berry flowers and the new seeds of red maple. After 20 minutes of huffing and puffing, 
I reached the remote woodsy location just below the crest of Johns Mountain. Here a network of ridges formed a semicircle enclosing a high altitude cove of perhaps five acres. Through a narrow gap at its lower end, a newborn spring-fed creek tumbles down the mountain. The cove's spacious setting brought to mind a loft created for a talented choir. Well-spaced trees sprinkled the woodland floor, but a lack of underbrush meant nothing really impeded visibility. But the cove is shallow enough and wide enough that getting a good photo proved to be impossible. Just above the cat's paw, I walked the knife-edged spine of John's Mountain away. Given the remoteness of this place, I doubt any human choir will ever perform from this mountain sanctuary loft. On the day of my visit, few birds dared give voice. The one exception was a white-breasted nuthatch in a splendid robe of iridescent white, black, and blue-gray. That gifted tenor scolded melodiously from the trunk of a nearby hickory tree. I wish a choir would perform at the cat's paw shown on the Sugar Valley Quandragle, or else from the sanctuary light cove below. I'd love to take a seat on the forest floor and listen to songs and hymns of praise to the Creator. Is there any doubt that those present would receive a renewing and freshening of the spirit? I once was lost, but now am found. Indeed. If you enjoy programming like this, please subscribe to this YouTube channel. Thank you for watching.